dedicatory epistle to lift luck on southern roads this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org lift luck on southern roads by tickner edwards dedicatory epistle to george c hayty r i my dear george hayty it is a queer confirmation of the waywardness or shall i say the inscrutability of the supreme direction that you and i each loving the same things and possessed of the same dislike for the hustle and din of modern workaday cities should the one being anchored apparently for life in the great dim backwater of london getting little or nothing of what he most desires and the other far beyond all evident deserts be free to roam this pleasant english land at will going by the most alluring and the sunniest bypaths tracking down will-o'-the-wisps of fact or fancy consorting for the most part with the staunchest and cleanest-hearted people in the world the english peasantry and generally skimming the cream of outdoor country life with no other care in the world than that omnipresent and salutary one the need for daily bread-winning in my case one and pretty hard one as you know at the point of a grey goose quill yet if fate should have destined the one of us for a vagabond but in theory for ever holding him fast among his colour boxes and canvases in the gloom of a london street it would avail nothing if the other out of sympathy should turn tail on his opportunities confessedly undeserved though they be god himself cannot help the man who misses his chances and if it has been my great good luck to be born a sort of medieval throwback and that a twin it were the direst folly to make a siamese affair of our twinship by electing to share your smoke and paving stones when i can do you immeasurably the better service standing afar off and calling over to you faithfully the tally of the seasons the blunt of the first green leaf summer's fulfilled magnificence the earliest shuttle throw of russet and gold when autumn is lagging in so here for you is the tale of my latest solitary ramble the journey covers as you shall see some two hundred odd miles through five southern counties and was conceived on an unusual plan for i went neither on foot nor by any of the wanted means of conveyance beloved of tourists neither by motor nor cycle phaeton nor ambling nag moreover i kept clear of the main roads and with two exceptions the great towns shunned nearly all the guide-book points of interest sought out the least frequented lanes and by-paths and found my history in the happy places that have no history other than that writ large over their moss-green roofs and lichen walls the english villages which as i look back on the long white road of the journey lie in the memory now like pearls on a silver string the truth is that on this latest desultory ramble i have been more the vagabond the incorrigible idler than ever sweet are the uses of infirmity and when one's infirmity is no worse than a sort of picturesque slacking of all members but eyes and ears and these alert very much and at all times no great harm is likely to accrue i got me to tell the truth through the whole two hundred mile stretch of the way with camera and pack on shoulder and at surprisingly little expense by means of lifts taken in any chance vehicle that might be faring in my direction 
once clear of the great fashionable watering place in far devon that was my starting point my plan consisted in waiting by the roadside or strolling gently onward until something on wheels it mattered not what overtook me and thus by fits and starts slow joltings in lumbering farm wagons steady crawls in brewers drays an occasional brisk mile or two in a doctor's or parson's gig quiet hours on the tailboards of pantechnicans a momentous evening in a missionary van sundry rides in tradesmen's carts in various counties in fact by dint of laying under use the whole gamut of country perambulation at length after many days of travel i found myself at my journey's end in drowsy arundel with a head stuffed full of memorable experiences and a great all but resistless longing to turn about there and then and do the journey over again well it is all set down here in these pages the golden autumn days with their heterogeneous comradeships their illuminating chats with tramps and gypsies in sunny hedgerow corners their sprinkle of adventure grim pathetic droll or hazardous their cakes and ale and merry talk in a score of village inns and the moonlit nights too some few spent out in the open the most of them passed under cottage roof trees where the glowing kitchen fireside was but reluctantly exchanged for the little attic chamber with its pink rosetted dimity and the lavender in its sheets many a time on the long way i thought of you and wished you were there to enjoy some particular country quip or whimsy or wondered what you would have done in any of a dozen situations that chanced upon the way how for instance you would have managed the over-cautious landlady who feared to let me lie at her inn in the lonely wiltshire village whether you would have interfered at all or have ventured to act as i did in the quaint love story of the little hampshire postmistress would the watercress minstrel have sung for you as he sang for me and would you have dubbed it dream or reality that strange midnight experience at stonehenge but all this is unduly premature and by way of spoiling the story yet to come one word more and that an indispensable one not all the places visited nor the people encountered on the route bear in these pages the names the map or the census roll assigns to them nor did some of the major incidents occur just where they are set down in the book dealing as it does with real living persons and their actual doings the reason for this is evident here and there i admit i have been constrained to ride a pretty high horse as you will be the first to tell me and once or twice to put on cap and bells but to masquerade in the full bottom wig and scarlet of the public censor has been very far from my purpose so i have used this red herring method the due privilege as i consider it of the professional looker-on at the game of life as far as might seem expedient it is not the isolated act but the common doings not the one man but the many on which bell book and candle were rightly employed signed t e end of dedicatory epistle chapter one of lift luck on southern roads by tickner edwards this librivox recording is in the public domain the siren city there are englishmen in venice so the story runs who have been going home every month for twenty years back and have never gone yet 
it has been next month and always next month and so the months have lengthened into years and the years into decades and still held by the siren song of the sea these happy exiles linger and drowse and dream in the sunshine until to their friends there is palpably no other going home for them but that last long going from which there is no return something of this sort commonly happens here in our own land to men of the hardy north and east who have been lured south-westward to torquay the town lies in a pool of well-nigh unbroken sunshine wedged in between a barrier of great rocky hills and the sea foreign-looking villas are dotted about everywhere in the greenery of the encircling heights the fish keys with their rows of limes and sauntering crowds the fussy little harbour the straggling house fronts each painted a different hue are all undisguisedly continental the public gardens might have been imported intact from any town on the riviera palms and queer exotic shrubs shadow the winding ways at every turn among the people even among the well-to-do there is a love of bright raiment wholly italian in spirit but most foreign of all is the climate the soft sleepy indolent air of south devon that pervades the whole place you may bring to it the liveliest energy you may be the most earnest go-ahead soul that ever lamp lighted through cheapside or the strand but once you have settled down in torquay and the place has got its slothful golden grip upon you it is good-bye to all your upstart aeroplaning moods in a little while you will have forgotten time and london almost as completely as the gently stirring multitudes around you to be in the sunshine and genially somnolently happy with your cigarette that will soon make up the sum of your convictions and your aspirations to wander round the quays and watch the great timber barks unloading look on at the emptying and filling of the little torbay steamers marvel at the luxuriousness of the anchored yachts and the tranquil obesity of the fishermen lean over the harbour wall by the hour in a brown study caught by the mesmeric scintillation of the water or lounge the morning away listening to the band in any one of a hundred sheltered sunny nooks that look out over the blue satin floor of the bay you will fall into the train of all these things naturally and unthinkingly and will at length be no more inclined to break from the spell of them than the anglo-venetian from the spell of his city in the sea so it proved in my own case i had come to torquay in the blazing summer time designing to let a month or so waste itself commendably in the easy devonian way but the summer had waned and set autumn had begun to burn in the far woodlands october was well upon her way and still the fascination of the place held me i was no more ready to go at this the eleventh hour than i was on that fair june morning when i had come to it taking as it were a plunge fathoms deep into the lethean sunshine of its thronging ways self-admonition had been no good it had been useless to upbraid the jolly hours here in the midst of them the reproving mind is so easily diverted especially if it happened to be your own and you the object of its censure but gradually the conviction dawned upon me that if i must go as was indeed indisputable 
the only way of it was to go on the spur of the moment to launch out blindly determinedly on the next freshet of good resolution that should come rippling near my lazy feet it was in the grey of an early morning in late october that the thing finally came to pass in torquay where the dense leafage puts even far-famed vallambrosa to shame you can never sleep through sunrise the thrushes and robins besiege your window with battering rams of music until you rouse and listen waiting as you must if your desire is more slumber for the quiet that comes only with the full of the day but this time i saw the new writing on the wall with the first eye that contrived to open it flashed upon me that my time was up at last that to-day i was really going in a moment i was out of bed and dressing as for a wager not daring to consider plans too closely lest with them might come those temperate second thoughts that had hitherto always been my undoing and within the hour i was out and off through the level sunbeams of the morning camera and pack on shoulder heading briskly northward with the long shadows of the tree trunks making a griddle of violet across the living amber of the deserted way the north road out of torquay is the seaside road at that early hour there was no one abroad but a stray milkman or two a few yawning rubbershod policemen and here and there a dissipated cat wending homeward in blear-eyed disillusionment of life oblivious of sparrows and thinking only of the kitchen hearth and a full saucer to come thus far i had so triumphantly held to my first resolution against plan-making that i had absolutely no idea of what lay before me beyond the general scheme of winning out into the country and there after breakfasting at some village inn to get out my maps and squarely face the business over a quiet pipe but as i gradually left the houses behind and the sun got higher and higher out of a calm empty sea and there came to me the scent of apple orchards and of ripe blackberries on the breeze i got me a picture of the heart of the country what it would be like now in late autumn when nobody goes to it holiday-making what the pleasure and profit of a long rambling jaunt afoot through county after county going always by the by-paths forgetting the very existence of towns and trains and politics and trying for a real glimpse into the wild life of the countryside in autumn and incidentally into the life of the english peasantry taken out of season and therefore unawares the more i thought of the plan the more it grew upon me it built up in my mind swift as the building of aladdin's palace every second added a story i had the battlements on and a brave flag flying from the topmost tower before i had gone another twenty paces and then on a sudden thought i plucked the whole vast edifice up by the roots demolished its foundations and had it firm on fresh new bearings all in the space of a moment for the sound of wheels had come up behind me and turning round i saw prophetically in the first of them the whole rumbling procession of my three score lifts it was a wide old-fashioned market cart and in it sat a ruddy old woman incredibly stout as she drew abreast of me at the foot of the hill her horse dropped to walking pace and i gave her good morning where to 
she asked by way of combined question and greeting i had made furtive inspection of the name and address on the cart shaft to stoke in tainhead mrs burrell said i trying my best to look tired and hot she eyed me keenly but very pleasantly then began to rummage down some empty potato sacks into a rough kind of seat beside her will you ride she asked in the broad devon tongue ye knows me better and i knows you but tis so we are great many of the new folks na not here up yonder top of the hill tis a sore bit of collar work this un for the old arse the old horse and i therefore trudged on side by side up the long slope and at the crest of it i climbed on to the potato sacks from here there was a magnificent open view of the hilly coast the jagged red sandstone cliffs looping away in a wide semicircle until the rosy peaks and curves with their green topping sank into the misty ultramarine for miles ahead the road followed the dips and curves of the seaside hills a broad white ribbon here at hand but dwindling to the finer silver thread where it vanished into the far-off valley of tain the old cart jogged and jolted and swung sideways on its crazy springs the cart and the sacks on which i was perched were clogged through and through with the rich red devon soil and at every jerk a fine dust rose about us mrs burrell was powdered over with it from head to foot and i was soon no better she looked round at me from time to time in a motherly sympathetic way tis the worst o taties she observed from first to last from seeding to marketing us be allus smothered wi it poor burrell when i went off i was as red as reynard there were no ridden none o it even then but tis rare healthy for the windbreak folks say she sighed looked solemn for a decent interval then lapsed again into her former cheerful mood upon which i hazarded an inquiry does stoke in tainhead lie over there i asked pointing along the cliff road for truth to tell i had never heard of the place before na sure tis right in land here us goes round this year bit o' turnin as the cart veered slowly round into the lane i stood up and looked behind me there are certain phases of primitive human feeling from which no civilization can emancipate us and among these stands that curious instinct to sentimentalize when we are doing for the last time even the most ordinary everyday things it had suddenly occurred to me that this would be my last view of the sea for it might be many a long day to come so i stood up and looked backward expecting to find myself instantly the prey of all sorts of stereotyped yearnings and regrets yet not the ghost of a sigh could i conjure up i tried again and again but it was no good there lay the heaving glittering plain of waters that had been my boon companion for so many months past a little chip of white sail shone like a butterfly's wing far out on the azure and i told myself it might have been my own craft and i the happy voyager on any other but this fatal day of farewell i probed my imaginative vitals down to the midriff for recollections of long sweet timeless traffickings on this nirvana of the deep days when the mackerel were in the bay and the flickering silver was hauling up at every moment over the gunwale of the boat 
days when the little lithe sixteen-footer sped on tiptoe joyously through the seething lop of a brisk sou'wester breeze and those most delicious times of all waiting for a wind far out at sea when the sun burned in a cloudless sky and not a breath stirred over the glassy stillness of the water when the sail hung limp and useless overhead and below the varnish bubbled in the seams but it was no good my pegasus would not soar an inch i turned back saddened to my potato sacks and found mrs burrell's blue slit of an eye fixed anxiously upon me ye are not hard up for a penny she inquired after a moment's awkward silence tain't much o a livin grindin they things and ye looks uncommon down jowled and hungry like if so be as the habit of treasuring antiquities in the shape of tweeds makes for personal comfort but it has its inconveniences on the road a good camera however will always save the situation i hastened to extract the opulent looking thing from its well-worn case and explained to mrs burrell its uses in another art than that to which she had dedicated it and we jogged on together talking of photography and potatoes until at length stoke and tainhead weathercock shone before us jaunty and golden over the tops of the trees i parted company from her at her own house a little short of the village and went the rest of the way on foot if i looked as hungry as i felt i must have been an affecting sight indeed the pure soft country air had made me ravenous and i marched straight down the village street with eyes for nothing but bears and bulls and spotted cows and such like hospitable beasts at last an inn sign came into view it swung from the gable end of a long low rambling house at a corner with a thatch above it green as a garden and latticed windows giving back the glow of the morning sun the door stood open and as i approached a broomhead kept popping in and out each time driving a billow of dust into the sunshine of the tidy street the young woman who was the cause of all this dispersal of atoms stopped in her work at sight of me she received my request in silence then turned me a very dubious troubled face breakfast well i dunno i'm sure there's naught in the house but and then as a happy afterthought but could ye make do anyhow wi' heggs and bacon could i i knew of no words to express my readiness silently gratefully i followed her into the cosiest little parlour i had ever seen the walls were of dark oak wainscoting there were cases of stuffed birds hanging between frames of sporting pictures varnished into brown indecipherable obscurity the chimney glass was wreathed in cut paper of canary hue a shining copper warming pan filled one corner and in another an old grandfather clock ticked its drowsy tranquil life away before the window lay the family bible covered with a bead mat and surmounted by a vase of pallid wax flowers under a glass dome footed in red chenille outside on the window-sill pots of geraniums made a barricade of scarlet and just above on a nail in the sunny wall hung a wicker cage with a blackbird in it a contented optimistic bird that now dug his golden beak into a sprig of groundsel and now uplifted it in mellow tuneful song impossible to associate with dissatisfaction at his lot 
or any desire to be free and while i sat contemplating all these good things the lady of the besom went to and fro each time adding some rich touch to the pitcher a snowy damask cloth to the old mahogany table silverware and blue china a steaming coffee jug a homemade loaf a bar of honey cascading golden tears then at last the depreciated dish the piece of resistance set in the midst of it all and giving forth an incense that was in itself a whole silent grace before meat when an hour later i had taken the road again fed refreshed the course of my prospective lift journey decided upon the sun was already high above the hilltop and everything promised for a fair day the plan i had sketched out was briefly this i was in no sort of hurry i meant therefore to lay down no definite line of route but merely to turn my face roughly eastward and keep moving day after day until such a time as my luck and the rolling stock of the road should bring me through to my journey's end now here i was in mid-devon between devonshire and sussex lay four other counties to wit somerset dorset wiltshire and hampshire but dorset lay along the coast and an essential part of my scheme was to get as soon as possible deep into the heart of the country it was clear then that i must strike up north for the whole of the first day at least and face about to the rising sun only when i was sufficiently far from the sea thus strolling onward and turning the matter over in my mind i soon left the village in my rear and found myself in the pleasant orchard country the wind had died down to the merest breath a vague somnambulist wind faintly aimlessly doddering about in the blue light of day everywhere about me there was the glow of apples red and yellow and green and in the hedgerows blackberries hung in drooping clusters cooking in the heat i soon came upon a gate of inviting presence a gate venerable bright with lichens conveniently broad in the beam obviously this was the destined waiting place for my next lift so i sat down filled a pipe and looked about me how quiet the place seemed after the everlasting murmur of voices and the hallooing trams of torquay and yet the quiet was many degrees removed from silence literary townsmen all seemed to fall into this one mistake they praise the country for many virtues but for none more than its beautiful and as one of them has it its healing silence but the truth is that country quiet owes its beauty and its charm of quelling nervous unrest not to its silence but to its living dim unceasing sound if you ever achieve absolute silence it will not soothe but terrify you for you will find unbroken silence only in the midst of prevalent death nature abhors silence almost as much as she does the vacuum in the whole year's round perhaps there is no moment of the night or day utterly bereft of sound unless it be the starless windless gloom of midnight at the season of a great frost while there is moving air or water there can never be true silence but on these bitter iron-bound nights something very like the silence of death falls upon everything stand on such a night in the depths of a wood 
or in some wide open space far from any town or human settlement then though the keenest ear will hardly detect a sound see if there be any beautiful or healing influence around you yet for wild nature at least death as well as life has its own telling signal when the great frost has held for many weeks locking up the food supply of the birds and bringing them face to face with starvation it is nearly always on nights such as these that the last breach is made in the citadel on midnight walks in the woodland at such a time you will often hear a dull thud on the frozen ground and it means that one more feathered creature has given up the fight dying where it perched in the scanty shelter overhead that eerie sound of death familiar on so many solitary winter walks in times gone by was brought back to me with a strange intensity as i sat on the gate in the sunshine of the quiet october morning waiting for my next host a wheel far behind me in the dense apple wood i heard something fall with a sound curiously like that made by the half-frozen body of a dead thrush in winter another such sound followed almost immediately and then another this time close at hand and a great ruddy apple came bowling over the grass almost to my feet these were not windfalls for the moment hardly a leaf stirred in the green roof of the wood it was but nature finishing the work she had begun in april blossom time and casting the dead ripe fruit to earth where more creatures could get at it to liberate its seed than was possible up there in the laden boughs looking down i saw that the apple full and round at all other parts was shrunken and deeply pitted on one side that was where the bee in her haste had passed by one of the five pistils in the apple flower leaving it unfructified and so the fruit had grown lopsided incomplete it would have been one of the finest and largest apples on the tree but for this unfortunate accident as it was it was fit for little else than the crushing mill in the tree above me i could see there were hundreds more just like it all alike had stood in the same fair way to perfection when the winged marauders from the hives had come chanting through the sun and air of the april morning but there were not bees enough for the work in no fruit-bearing district that i know of in the land are there enough bees kept good apples are almost as much a product of the hives as honey itself if only fruit growers could be brought to realize it where were the bees now i wondered sitting on the gate and watching the blue tobacco smoke drift idly away on the veering air farther up the lane i could see an old barn with its roof all but hidden under a dense canopy of ivy and at the thought i got down and strolled towards it as i drew near the murmur that had reached me by the gate grew to an uproar of insect voices the whole great mass of ivy was smothered in minute golden blossoms the nectar in each glistening in the vivid light here were bees thousands of them not indeed working with the frantic energy of summer but busy enough in a mature deliberate autumnal way and there were not only hive bees but almost every other winged atom in creation carousing at the ivy feast hoarse-voiced bumblebees butterflies bluebottles innumerable yellow barred 
piratical looking wasps and scrambling crane flies literally by the thousand and amidst all these a jostling crowd of nameless creatures of all sizes and hues taking their fill of sweets eager to get all they could of this the last outdoor banquet of the year but i had only a moment or two to watch them the grinding of heavy wheels became suddenly the dominant note of the morning and round the bend in the lane came a wagon and team whose driver cracked his whip merrily as he approached the wagon was full of apples tons of them apparently of every colour and degree of ripeness and on the top of the heap sat the wagoner a lanky tow-headed youth with a plume of purple heather in his cap the wagon moved so slowly that the boy and i were able to exchange greetings and other wayfaring amenities well within the time the jingling team took to saunter by where are you going with all those apples i asked him he had the soft lazy south devon accent to perfection hardly opening his lips he let the words roll about in his mouth as though they were sugar plums home said he pointing across country with his whip to thrushelton for the cider megan us grows a par of em and us buys a sight more these be from stoke yonder tis the third lud since sun up did you never see cider made what never well come along away a moment more and i had mounted by his side at this ready invitation and was off to thrushelton wherever that might be to see the cider mill at work whether my experience that day was typical of farmhouse cider making in devonshire or whether i had the misfortune only to come upon an aspect of it rare as it was bad i am bound to say that i left the cider farm profoundly disillusioned as to many things above all i could not help being struck by the squalid not to say disgusting surroundings in which the work was carried on thrushelton proved to be not very far half an hour's steady going over hill and dale through the interminable apple woods brought us into the midst of thatched roofs and we stopped at the gate of a farmyard the whole miry space was littered with straw knee-deep in which stood a herd of cows contentedly chewing pigs and poultry of all kinds wallowed and scratched in the filth dark puddles lay about everywhere from which the sun drew up a sickly stench our wagon went squelching through it all and pulled up at the side of a building which proved to be the cider factory here the apples were shovelled in through a big window of the loft where more shovelling brought them to a great funnel in the floor whence they descended into the crushing machinery in the lower story hard and hot work it was and needing many hands half a dozen men were engaged on it stripped to their shirts i watched them for a while and then my curiosity aroused by a deep rumbling and clanking that came from below i got down to explore the under regions of the place it was no easy matter to pick a clean way through the mud and sodden litter of the yard but i got round to the main door at last the building was partly underground and being lit only by a few small slits in the wall and these almost entirely obscured by cobwebs it was some time before i could discover what was doing at last i made out an old horse tramping wearily round a centre-post and some dun-coloured unsavoury-looking matter 
which i guess to be the crushed apples dribbling through the funnel in the ceiling and slopping down into a big vat below there several men were packing the stuff into horsehair bags which in turn were stacked one over the other in the cider press and from this press flowed continuously a liquid dark sludgy and altogether of most uninviting appearance for some minutes i stood in my corner dazed by the gloom the noise the busy reverberation of voices and wondering if this were really typical of devonshire cider making years ago in the valley of the rhine i had watched the grape harvesting and followed the dripping fragrant wagons to the wine press the horses garlanded in bright dahlias as though for a public holiday but i had never gone inside and seen the crushers at work perhaps if i had much the same disillusionment would have come to me as did on that day at the devonshire cider farm i quickly got tired of the turmoil and darkness and heavy sweet miasma of the place and retracing my way through the soggy yard was soon on the road again glad enough to be out once more in pure air and untrammelled light End of chapter 1chapter two of lift luck on southern roads by tickner edwards this librivox recording is in the public domain the motor man and now there befell me an adventure disquieting enough for the moment but proving to have the happiest effect on the fortunes of my whole journey for it warned me in time against what might have lost me many pleasant encounters and illuminating hours i had hardly hoped to escape altogether from the presence of motors even when going by the least frequented ways in fact i had all but reckoned on an occasional motor lift if only as a variation in the scheme of travel now turning a sharp bend in the lane i came suddenly upon what struck me as the most magnificently appointed car i had ever seen it was drawn up at the roadside and had evidently been under repair for the owner was busily packing away a number of tools that lay about him but the trouble was obviously at an end now and the car ready for work as i came up with it the driver touched some part of its mechanism and the engine immediately burst into a tumult of humming and whirring he looked round at me with what seemed rather disproportionate satisfaction beaming in his eyes off the switch he cried merrily did you see it no grinding away at handles just a touch of the switch and away she goes <laughs> he burst into a delighted peal of laughter his joy at the event was so entirely genuine that i not understanding in the least why he laughed fell to laughing with him it put us at once on the easiest of terms do you understand motors he went on in an abrupt hearty way no then you must think me a fool of course no one but a motorman can appreciate the quality of an engine that starts from the switch but hello it's nearly midday i must be off he scrambled into his seat by the by he added looking back which way do you happen to be going not to exeter i suppose because if you are i shall be most happy behind us then in the wooded lane there rang out the familiar sound of wheels turning i saw a comfortable basket chaise creeping placidly along in the sun-flecked shadows 
a sleek well-fed pony in the shafts and just as sleek and well-nourished a figure of an old gentleman sitting prim and bolt upright within it wrapped about with a tartan shawl there was a vacant seat beside him he looked the picture of genial communicativeness i turned to the motorman to make my excuses for i had not the smallest reason or desire to go anywhere near exeter but as i turned one of those queer perverse impulses to which we are all subject seized upon me without any volition of my own the intended refusal of his offer changed on my lips to acceptance and i got into the car it was my first lift in a motor and before we had gone a furlong i was vowing it should be the last it became at once clear to me that its owner was bent on making a show of its capabilities the lanes were narrow here much wooded and full of abrupt turns but he set his engine immediately to what seemed a dangerous pace a keen searching wind sprang up from nowhere changing the mild autumn weather to chilly winter at a stroke the trees and hedgerows got themselves legs and raced by in an indistinguishable streak of green the woods beyond began that giddy twirling movement that you see from the window of an express train my companion let out another notch or two of the motor's caged up energy and bent silently to his work i dragged my cap over my eyes and buttoned up my ineffectual coat every second or two the bugle blared out its deep note and the driver carried another contrivance which he shouted to me was an electric buzzer a snarling rasping thing whose note seemed nothing less than an insult to the morning now the brakes went on and we slowed down to thread a village street some day i will go back to that village and spend a whole penitential morning there by the hurried glimpse i got of it it seemed a beautiful little place but all i saw of it then was a blurred thicket of housetops some scurrying poultry and frightened screaming children a rush of apron mothers to cottage doors and then we were out between the gliding hedgerows again swooping along at a faster pace than ever the motorman turned me an enthusiastic beaming face the most exhilarating thing in the world he shouted who would crawl along with horses after a taste of this but wait until we get through newton abbott you shall see what speed is then a gas lamp started up by the roadside and then another the flying trees got fewer and spinning houses suddenly plentiful about us the brake jammed on again and we dropped to a tortoise like eight miles an hour i mopped the tears from my streaming eyes we must be careful here said the motorman they are so absurdly particular especially on market days i will make pious pilgrimage also to newton abbott some day and take my fill of the joys of an old-fashioned market day in a thriving ancient west of england town but it was lost to me for that journey i had indeed a half resolve to cry halt and escape from the juggernaut of excruciating modernity that had me in its thrall but before i could make up my mind about it we had pierced through the crowd of men and lowing beasts and lines of hucksters booths and were pounding up a steep hill at the other end of the town afterwards i made out from my map that it was some thirteen or fourteen miles from newton to exeter 
there was not a yard of the way but was strewn with my vain regrets and will at the earliest chance be reconnoitred on foot but i remember hardly anything about it i have a confused notion of a country beautiful in the extreme bleating by like an april shower i know we rushed half a dozen villages each of which would have furnished the profitable pleasuring of an hour i recollect taking to the moors and storming like an atlantic liner through a sea of heather half crimson half rich brown with breaking waves of gorse golden upon it everywhere i got one swift peep into a gypsy camp a little vortex of wild life right on the summit of the highest hill and then we let go of cloudland and shot like a meteor mile after mile down into a blue abyss of valley with the smoke and rooftops spires and greenery of exeter lying like a toy city far below that was the maddest wickedest stretch of the whole iniquitous journey and it drove my folly well home to me i sat as close as i could feeling like an autumn leaf blown against a wall a leaf that might the next instant be wafted miles high across country my clothes were not the slightest service to me the motorman was cased in leather from head to foot but as for me the blast cut clean through every garment and i was as cold as watercress in a midwinter pond but deliverance was not far now our lightning swoop downward ended a hurtling mile or two shot us into the arms of civilization once more with a sigh audible above the sough of the wind and the throbbing of the engine my companion put the brake lever hard over and unwillingly enough slowed down to legal pace we crawled into the town to the old harsh duet of buzzer and bugle and pulled up at the foot of the main street i stayed hardly a moment to tender the motorman perfunctory thanks for the ride then made straight for the nearest public house my teeth were chippering together idiotically i was numb to the spine my uncertain feet would scarce carry me across the roadway i had but one idea a potion hot and strong as the place could brew it i shouldered into the crowded bar behind which the landlord stood perspiring in his shirt-sleeves he took my order with evident surprise warm as summer isn't it he remarked fire bless you we don't want no fire why i've started selling lemon squashes again i stayed in exeter perhaps an hour wondering at the magnificence of the shops wondering still more at the populous state of the thoroughfares which would not have disgraced london city on a fairly busy day above all i was impressed by the keen metropolitan air of the people and the brisk pace with which all seemed to move lounging through the busy high street after lunch almost the only idler in the throng the thought came to me why they are exactly like london devonians and considering this farther i seemed to get a clue to a matter that had long puzzled me with most english provinces to know the men of them is almost to know the provinces themselves climate and soil are alike reflected in the bluff brown faces the yorkshireman's downrightness and sturdiness and homely bonhomie are plainly derived from his vast bleak acres surrey gravel would speak if it could in the easy-going hasteless surrey lingo 
the crisp quick tang of highland sussex is the very voice of the tireless downland wind and the rolling hills of chalk but of devon you will learn very little by studying devonshire men in london go among the thousands of them there and if you have never been in the southwest country you will get an impression of a land not unlike scotland a close-fisted screwing yet lovable land a land of breeding out of sheer necessity a tough-natured canny domineering race one with their native soil loving to speak of it at all times but turning their backs upon it with all the resigned yet shrewd alacrity of the scot but devonshire is the very antithesis of all this if the rule were to hold good soil and climate producing the man devonians would be known by their static genial drift with the tide ways whenever we met a good-natured indolent countryman with a taste for lolling in the sunshine quick for the pleasant useless side issues of life and very slow for the things that are hard and ugly and vitally important we should be ready to wager that he came from this lotus-eating land of the west well the county does really abound in such people you find them everywhere in the rural districts but in these alone they do not go to the great towns hardly ever do they stray beyond their native horizons as a rule they are content to live and love be merry and die within the charmed circle of the same few hills cities like exeter are made by a separate local strain of humanity an upcropping here and there of virtually alien folk they exist because there is this special imperious call for them they are quarantines of independence and to them flock all the hardy keen penurious souls of the county and from them come the men of devon that londoners know men of brawn eager witty undisguisedly commercial men that take up the running with the best of us soon out cockneying the various cockney of the lot i never knew telegraph wires sing as those sang that led me out of exeter i kept to the great main road designedly for the rest of the day that i might the sooner win northward to my turning point whence i intended to go due east through the shyest least exploited country i could find there was very little wind abroad but overhead as i rode along through the rich afternoon light a deep quiet voice incessantly held forth and at every post it challenged me with a hoarser melody than ever if you have never ridden on the tailboard of a pantechnicon van you will hardly realize the serene satisfaction of that afternoon's journey still smarting under the indignity of the morning's escapade and thoroughly surfeited with pace i fairly gloated over our deliberate progress it was like sitting on your own back doorstep while your house moved steadily across country on the same perch with me sprawled a beery man in a green baize apron but he was fast asleep most of the time and did not interfere with my meditations to all intents and purposes i was alone on this gently voyaging platform and had nothing to do but watch the sights of the road hearken to the lulling song of the wires above me and let the mellow afternoon sunbeams steep me through and through i was for Colompton, some thirteen miles off and the van was going all the way it was perhaps the least eventful stage of the whole journey but it had its small interests and inconspicuous pleasures at every turn moreover 
i was outrageously comfortable i sat in a kind of nest like a saddle-bag armchair made up of bales of soft household lumber the man at the other end of the tailboard had little else than some odd garden tools and a lawn-mower to lie on but as he was apparently quite content and snored uninterruptedly i did not trouble about him our progress was extraordinarily quiet the van made only a dull subterranean sort of rumbling that did not really disturb the peace and solitude of the ride all that tranquil golden afternoon and far into the red twilight we ambled on now and then the van pulled up at a wayside inn at its stoppage my companion invariably woke up stretched himself got sleepily off his bunk and followed the driver into the bar for the first few times i went in with them and paid their score but they proved the dullest pair of fellows i ever took road with and i soon tired of their comradeship thereafter remaining in my cosy nook until such time as it pleased them to move on and when this happened the man in the green baize apron was always asleep again before we had travelled half a mile the sun went down in a flare of scarlet an amazing light that still held faintly low on the earth line long after the darkness had hidden everything else once as this light was deepening into dusk i dozed off myself and woke to a terrifying spectacle i found myself surrounded by a surging roaring crowd of what seemed to be horned demons with great glowing eyes and wide nostrils that spurted steam in a hundred directions at once but we were only threading our way through a herd of half wild cattle fresh from the market and soon left them behind darkness had completely fallen when at length we drew into Colompton, and i parted company with the furniture men and later when i looked out of the little window of the inn chamber up into the star-gemmed sky the song of the telegraph wires was still above me its soft clear music went with me into the land of dreams all through the hush of the long autumn night End of chapter two chapter three of lift luck on southern roads by tickner edwards this librivox recording is in the public domain the first step eastward Colompton by daylight proved to be just the kind of place one would expect from its name it had a blunt taciturn almost surly look in the wide curving high street the houses seemed like strangers brought together in a crowd and having just as little affinity old and new were strangely intermingled there were lofty red brick houses with bulging bow windows stretching the whole height of their fronts and square fortress-like houses with little coven roofs peering over stone edge rampart tops ochred walls and thatch ancient tiles and lowering grey slate ranked together with grisly sixteenth-century stonework and the blank utilitarianism of houses whose mortar was scarcely dry yet the place had a staid comfortable air of its own and the people a leisureliness of movement in refreshing contrast to the throb and turmoil of busy exeter i got away just as the sun had cleared the eastern hills feeling i was well on my destined and desired road at last in the green outskirts of the town 
i fell in with a friendly butcher boy who on the first word of inquiry fairly boiled over with intricate topography he waved a blue calico arm at the distant landscape see they girt long streak o hills said he black down hills they be well now get o'er they and there you be in somerset he proceeded to pour out an interminable list of names places i was to pass through turnings to avoid shortcuts to be artfully negotiated but the sight of the far-off blackdown range was guidance enough for the present i decided to forget the minutiae of his directions and hitching up the straps of my pack a hole or two set off gladly enough on the first stretch of the day's journey it was one of those happy autumn mornings happy because nature had ceased to look forward had given up ideals and aspirations and was frankly making the most of what remained to her of summer growth and life overhead the warm west wind harped in the treetops of the wooded lane and the weak sunlight kept coming and going across the path before me the distant blue hills lit up one by one with a searching touch of gold to windward behind me there was an ominous bank of cloud innocent enough at present but which might mean rain before the day was through looking about me as i strode along it came as a revelation that here in the heart of the west country autumn had in truth scarce begun by the sea the brine laden air of late october had filled the woods with a tawny light but here inland the trees still carried their full canopy of green leaves hardly tinged by the season the hedgerows on either hand waded in bright colour i counted a dozen different kinds of wild flowers growing abundantly within the space of a few yards poppies in plenty and the yellow of hawkweed buttercups and dandelions at every step of the way there was a wealth of campions pink and white red archangel cranesbill nipplewort and silverweed wild strawberry blossom starred the green banks nodding purple heads of sheepspit stood up out of a rich growth of ferns and greenery innumerable higher in the hedges there were clambering vetches tall st john's wort a sprinkling of late blackberry bloom mingling with the yellow of the gorse wherever a gap or gate in the hedgerows opened up the fields beyond these were bright with veronica and milfoil while here and there a whole hillside glowed with charlock like a river of gold noting these things joyfully as i went i had covered several miles of the way when at a sharp turn the road divided into two equally well-beaten tracks and brought me to an indecisive halt there was a signpost but it had been newly painted its three arms pointed truthfully enough in the three directions yet bore never a word as to what lay beyond i was staring at this somewhat ruefully and wishing i had taken more careful note of the butcher boy's instructions when a slouching footstep sounded behind me and a little dumpy man came up wearing an apron and carrying a light ladder and a pot of paint i guessed him to be the sign painter and naturally appealed to him for guidance but instead of the civil reply i had counted on i got to my surprise only a surly grunt and an order to stand out of the way he reared the ladder against the signpost mounted it unsteadily 
and proceeded to get his tools ready looking down at me from time to time with a malicious grin you just bide there along he said between hiccups and watch what i'm a-goin to do you'll learn all about it soon enough evidently he thought this a capital joke for he kept chuckling to himself as he stirred the paint spinning out his preparations for the job to their uttermost length and when at last he was ready for work he started on the arm that pointed back to Colompton, knowing well that this would be of least service to me it was altogether a difficult situation my first impulse on a flood of righteous indignation was to upset him ladder paint pot and all into the ditch but a second and brighter idea occurred to me i sat down under the hedgerow nearby and patiently waited it was a good half hour before having finished his work he came lumbering down the ladder again and tittered off down the road when he was gone round the crook of the lane i rose full of the purpose that had long been caged up within me i plucked a big tussock of grass and painstakingly rubbed out all the letters on the signpost when the words were reduced to undistinguishable grey smudges i went on my way in jubilant self-content but it was a short-lived triumph before a dozen yards were behind me the stupidity of the act came well home it is true i had revenged myself on the sign painter he would have his work contract work no doubt to do over again and thus far he was rightly served but until this was done every innocent stranger that happened by would have to suffer with him in its trivial way it was a good instance of the folly of human meddling with the profoundly intricate matter of retribution for that is the forbidden fruit of which none but the omnipotence may eat and go scatheless a very little man may give to undeserts and give not unwisely but it takes a god to pay i had been some two hours on the road now and the character of the country had entirely changed i could no longer see the black down hills the way ran in the midst of dense woods in and out of little dells full of the sound of water or through deep cuttings in the rocky summits of precipitous hills these deep clefts were always overarched with a thicket of beech and holly and bramble so that they were more like tunnels than open ways outside the morning had cleared and the sun shone hot as on a summer noon but into these tunnels hardly a ray penetrated they were deliciously cool and what light there was filtering through the close-woven branches overhead gave to everything a greenish tinge in the shadiest of them it was like walking in some grotto at the bottom of the sea and the long lines of ivy and bramble that hung from the roof and the delicate ferns that clothed the rock on either hand served to complete the illusion under any conditions it would have been difficult to hurry on such a drowsy sun-steeped morning and i found it next to impossible to get through any of these dim cloister-like places without a halt time life itself seemed to slow up to a sane and manageable pace directly the footsteps began their rhythmic echo within them but indeed after the first day of the journey time became of little more value to me than the gold doubloons to robinson crusoe for the rest of my wanderings 
i never once thought of it as a thing that spent itself and passed it is only in the life of cities and on the great main roads that the hours exist to lag or fly here in the quiet devon lanes time seemed as much a static condition as sunshine or the waters of ocean it was something that abided an eternal medium of life and not a gliding current that unexploited at the moment was to be lost for ever perhaps the whole idea of time is nothing but a sort of chance child of minds reared in the competitive forcing beds of cities a mulish barren thing by hurry out of unfaith whenever in my journeyings i chanced upon a main road or came up into a centre of civilization, the clattering hooves of this rough-shod cross-bred jade dinned out just as the sound of them faded when i got me back into the old serene byways but apart from this fancy walking on main roads is an intolerable thing you are always being reminded of your journey's end the very milestones are set by the way to hustle you thither and you are always coming upon great stretches of blank thoroughfare ahead straight euclid lines of vacuity that appall tired feet but the byways are forever twisting and turning hoodwinking progress revealing to you the future only in brief alluring glimpses you are led onward imperceptible step by step you are never getting anywhere you are always there where you want to be until unexpectedly you find yourself somewhere else just as pleasant at a sudden bend of the way i had poor luck that morning in the matter of lifts but i now fell in with a travelling companion of the quaintest sort by whose help i got hold of some precious things he was one of the old-fashioned peddlers of the kind that one meets only in the shyest remotest country districts and he sat on a heap of stones by the roadside sunning himself luxuriously and smoking a clay pipe which had no visible stem the bowl of it was literally under his nose it must have been nearly red-hot to judge by the glowing tobacco within but it seemed to cause him no inconvenience he looked round as i came then rose to his feet and made me a bow that was an astonishing mixture of respect courtliness and avowed almost defiant independence a brave morning said he and a good road and what more might a man need in life he looked at me out of a lean sun-blackened face that was covered all over with deep lines and wrinkles his eyes were bright and of the colour of gold like a hawk's altogether he wore an unmistakably predatory look yet he had the smile and the soft flute-like voice of an archdeacon shall i tell ye he went on lifting and easily swinging to his shoulder a pack that looked beyond all human power to carry shall i tell ye now why tis good company and ye're goin through to colmstock capital and ye'll not take it ill if old nolly tidball steps along by your side for a mile or two ah so i could have swore from the look o ye thereupon he fell into pace with me trudging along under his enormous burden as though it were a mere featherweight and whether talking or silent he kept the little black pipe aglow all the time you don't know this country he asked you were never here by a fall ah lack a day is it forty-nine or fifty years i've tramped it young man and old summer and winter 
i dunno now to be free with ye what might ye be after in these parts i gave him a sketch of the journey i had in view and its objects he visibly brightened and not sullen northen why i was afeard but let that bide anyhow i knowed as twern't drapery with that his last reserve vanished and we became close friends his way lay by a roundabout route through half a dozen villages and all that morning we peddled together alone i might have wandered that countryside for weeks and never seen half the things that came to me in those two memorable hours for the ordinary tourist the home life of cottage folk is almost as difficult to observe as that of the rabbits in their burrows no device or subterfuge will show you more than a starchy dame at a door or bring you anything better than a ceremonious ten minutes in a best parlour even if you succeed in beguiling an entry but in the company of the old peddler i found myself on an altogether new footing he was universally known among the people we visited and a welcome was ready for him everywhere with each cottage we came to he invariably marched round to the back door a thing that in a mere stranger would have been instantly and bitterly resented but before doing this he always stopped and had something to say about the place under his breath no smoking here he said knocking out his pipe at the first garden gate and try and look a bit pious like tis a mornin house we threaded our way through bushes laid out with drying linen ducked under a full clothesline and pulled up at an open door from within there came the squelching sound of a wash-tub and a melancholy quavering old voice raised in a moody and sankey hymn the old peddler coughed gently the doleful music ceased an old woman came to the door shading bleak grey eyes from the sun northen to-day nolly northen at all she began but nevertheless watched the swift opening of the pack with all a child's curiosity and so i was sayin mrs crick to my prentice here but i says no harm done i says if we just looks in to see how to a goin wi ye are ye bearin up my dear that there's an uncommon fine bit of crape such a real good man as he was jet brooches is all the go in lunnon ninepence thisn mrs cripp if ever man alive stood near the golden gate twere he i'll go bail none of your maunderings just a step and in he were as i said a minute ago to my and sure ye'll be wantin em sundays mrs cripp fast black we clocks all the way up i the latest fashion his face was the very picture of decent woe and his voice a match to it as he knelt rummaging in his pack and producing one after another the named articles of merchandise but at our next stopping place a few doors farther up the village street an extraordinary change had come over him as he lighted his pipe again he looked round at me with a roguish humoursome air now i don't rightly know as i ought to take ye in here he said nolly tidball he's old and ugly and safe now howsomever he led the way through a bright tidy garden round a green water-butt at the corner and into a red brick yard the kitchen door and window both stood open and here we came into a full flood tide of the merriest voices i had ever heard even in the merry land of devon the old peddler started gorm said he and fell to whistling see the conquering hero comes with all his might 
he had a loud penetrating note and at the first bar of the music the voices stopped a pretty head was thrust out of window and quickly withdrawn tis old nolly cried some one hailin in joe cried some one else and a burly man in his shirt sleeves appeared at the door how be you nolly tis a great day wi us and what do you think here's young bill come home he roared the words out delightedly seized the old peddler by the shoulders and bundled him in i following the hubbub had commenced anew the little kitchen was packed full of happy vociferating folk there were father mother three or four hearty wholesome girls and grandfather in the chimney corner while standing up in the midst of them with his black curly head scraping the whitewash from the ceiling was a sailor who laughed and shouted with the best tis bill come home nolly echoed the older woman laughter in her voice and tears in her eyes bill's home nolly bill's home cried all the merry girls together ay nolly tis true bill's home again piped up the old grandfather in a shrill falsetto from his glowing nook on the table stood a dusty stone bottle from which we were both instantly regaled you recommember eighty three nolly said the burly man foaming the cider out into the blue mugs well tis a drop o' that i allus said as i'd keep un till william showed up again and here he be we drank the sailor's health and then the old couple's and after that long life to the ancient man in the corner in spite of the fact that he was already ninety-three and when the stone bottle had grown as light as the lightest heart among us bill squared himself ceremoniously and called to the old peddler to open his pack that pack was a mystery to me and remained so to the end at the first cottage it seemed to contain nothing but the most lugubrious wares but now it bloomed like a flower garden nolly brought out silk handkerchiefs that would have put a summer rainbow to shame earrings and necklaces and brooches brighter and better than gold and studded with jewels that you could never have bought in bond street he produced neckties and scarves bottles of scent tied up in ribbon cakes of fancy soap lace enough to bedizen a whole parish and when the lordly bill had distributed presents to every one nolly had still something more he fumbled in his waistcoat pocket and brought out a little parcel of tissue paper this he opened with an odd smile and laid it outspread on the kitchen table it contained a dozen or so of shining silver wedding rings an instant silence fell upon the whole company and all looked at bill to a just a thought and no more said the old peddler after a while conscious of the difficult atmosphere and feeling his way very carefully knowing what i knows and thinkin like as not as bill here might be takin a bit of a stroll down the lane presently well well tis a brave day for a homecomin and what spanglorious fine cider to be sure and all i parted from the old peddler when an hour later we drew in sight of colmstock he had a call to make at a farmhouse a mile away from the road and the last i saw of him was not of him at all but of his belongings the great pack jogging comfortably along with a pair of gaiters dangling beneath it and a trail of blue tobacco smoke lingering behind i watched this phenomenon until it dipped out of sight over the top of the hill then went on to colmstock alone End of chapter three
Chapter Four of Lift Luck on Southern Roads by Tickner Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Calmstock Cat. Calmstock Square Grey Tower peeps at you inquiringly over a green valley brink as you come to it through the leafy lane. It struck me as being a typical progressive village it was made up of every kind of human tenement old and new jumbled inconsequently together all the old cottages wore to my fancy an undeniably shamefaced and superseded air while the new and ugly seemed too self-complacent evidently in no sort of doubt as to their right to exist there was a fair sprinkling of the artistic new bravely enough conceived but amidst their hoary surroundings giving you much the same impression of artifice as you get from old english village homesteads at an exhibition altogether i formed only a very moderate half liking for calmstock on a first view of it but reflecting that i was weary and hungry decided to leave farther estimations until i had eaten and drunk at the inn it was the quietest and cleanest and perhaps the barest inn i had ever chanced upon the floors were scrubbed to an unimpeachable a distressing whiteness not a speck of dust was visible anywhere nor any sign of life until my clattering boots brought a tidy woman into the parlour to take my order for ale and bread and cheese i had the parlour all to myself and sat for a long while munching at the plain deal table wrapped about with a silence that was a positive tangible thing between the table and the fireplace a beam of sunshine slanted down to the immaculate floor but it revealed hardly a moat in its path nor a single stray atom of defilement where it poured at my feet of a sudden i stopped eating beset with a curious idea that something was about to happen and it did a faint tapping sounded in the long passage outside it grew louder and presently a lean lanky yellow hen cruised in at the open door obviously in search of crumbs i kept perfectly still the hen went about with her head askew narrowly inspecting the place she seemed cautious to an absurdity taking each step with a painful wariness and making no advance without each time thoroughly reconnoitring every corner of the room her footsteps on the hardwood floor were as acute as the blows of a hammer in the pervading silence she could not muffle them try as she would though every moment saw her anxiety redoubled what was she so desperately afraid of i thought to myself and then i caught sight of the other personage in the little dumb show drama on the window ledge slumbering in the sunlight lay a frowsy tabby cat who now as i for the first time observed her opened one eye a wary vixenish green eye and turned it upon the hen the reason for the hen's cautious demeanour was at once apparent and as speedily justified it is a moot point whether any sense of humour has been vouchsafed to the lower creation but the old cat at calmstock possessed this sense if ever four-footed creature did she rolled to her feet and made as if she would spring there was no harm in the act she had evidently not the slightest wish to hurt the hen it was merely a feline joke she did not even leave her snug perch and for all i know the thing may have been done entirely for my own entertainment 
she may have wished me to see what a comical figure a hen cuts when she is made to run on a surface unsuited for clawed feet and this hen for all her instant and frantic efforts made as little progress on the hard polished boards as a man on a treadmill until giving it up at last she took wing and cluttered screeching out into the yard communicating her alarm to all her fellows there so that the whole village rang with their din thereupon the old cat settled down again with a fat contented smile upon her face and smirked herself to sleep i could have stopped i think for half the day in that little silent shrouded monastic room watching the pool of sunshine travel slowly past my feet but it was already late well over three o'clock and high time to be moving i got my rucksack and camera comfortably settled on my back and faced about once more for the black down range beyond the village the road took a winding course between high hedgerows overshadowed by trees as i went along i thought i had never seen so many birds nor heard such a variety of song thus late in the season to-morrow it would be november and yet the thrushes were piping as though it were a summer's day as i moved a little cloud of finches gambolled on before me from the oak branches overhead the tits sent down a slender seesaw melody and now right at my elbow as i passed a robin began his old old song i stopped to listen he shouldered himself a little farther up the bramble spray but abated not a jot of his quaint music it chimed in wonderfully with the rest of the chorus and facing about to the warm sun with closed eyes i got back for a moment the whole illusion of summer but it was only for a moment standing there in the full tideway of all that streaming light and music playing the blind man in a rather precious fancy i became gradually aware of a note above me very different from all the rest i opened my eyes but could see nothing yet the sound was there low at first but swiftly growing in volume with every second it had swollen to a great hurricane voice overwhelming everything at its fullest it was strangely like the uproar of an express train storming by within a few yards of me although there was nothing of the rumble and clatter only a mighty rushing sibilance in my ears there against the blue sky above me i now made out the cause of it all a vast army of small birds probably starlings was sweeping by at an incredible rate the sky was suddenly darkened by their passage they were spread out like a great fan with its convex edge forwards and the whole company moved in a solid phalanx straight for the south a moment more and they had passed out of sight and hearing as swiftly as they had come the quiet music and the golden light of afternoon were back again to the solitary country road in all their old tranquillity pushing onward now i was surprised to find how near i had come to the hills that had been beckoning me onward all the morning they seemed but a mile or two away grand precipitous country with a singular landmark or beacon raised upon the highest peak i walked perhaps a mile out from the village and that as it proved was to be my last step for the day first a smart dog-cart came gliding up in my rear noiseless on its rubber wheels and before i could turn its owner a slim black-bearded parson had pulled up short 
and asked me if he could help me out on my way he took me perhaps three miles at what i am bound to record was a decidedly unclerical pace and dropped me as though it had been prearranged right into the arms of a young farmer with a tilt cart full of meal bags who was walking up a hill i walked with him until we reached the hilltop and then without any word from me the side on the matter of a lift he politely requested me to get up first this was but my second day on the road and i was new to the work in after days i found myself accepting such kindnesses almost as a matter of course the common prerogative of the foot passenger whenever it pleased him to exercise it but this time i thanked my host so gratefully that it made him stare it proved a dull ride for i could get from him nothing but monosyllables or often as not only a slow chuckle strangely like the call note of a woodpecker indeed he was very nearly as wild and as simple a bird as any in the woods we passed his costume though of a type common enough on fete days in the west country would have astounded a metropolitan eye he wore a suit of black and brown check of so large a pattern that three or at the most four of its squares sufficed to cover his broad chest it was adorned with an infinity of smoke pearl buttons not only where buttons are ordinarily visible but lavished in all sorts of unlikely places on his pocket flaps and down the side of his leg he wore a soft floppy hat of light grey felt the high-pointed crown merging imperceptibly into the broad brim round this surprising head covering was loosely tied a black ribbon in which was stuck a great pompon of scarlet rowan berries his collar was of enamelled leather striped vertically in red white and blue for necktie he wore a bunch of black silk knotted and tangled together and the whole was dominated by a huge silver watch-chain strong and weighty enough apparently to cable a ship we jogged along for several miles together this bucolic dandy sitting on one shaft and i on the other for the meal bags filled the cart to the brim and then i began to notice a strange thing we had been heading for the black down hills the whole of the time but had to all appearance got no nearer for all our leagues of progress they still seemed the same few miles away i drew my companion's attention to this fact and then got from him the only considerable remark he ventured on during the whole ride tis the rain a-comin he said flicking with his beribboned whip at the horse's ears like as not twill be a seltzer afore night you allers knows by the look of the hills looking about me then i saw that this prognostication was likely to come true the wind was getting up and the last of the daylight speedily failing black swampy rain clouds were driving up astern the trees began to toss their arms about weirdly overhead a bevy of rooks were cawing homeward blown hither and thither by the sudden breeze how far is it to these hills i asked him he took so long to reply that i began to think he had not heard me two mile he said at last maybe three a full five minutes later he surprised me by a speech of his own initiation you bides along o me first church stanton and when you be there why there you be of church stanton i got only a lightning impression of a brown church a yellow inn and a sprinkling of toadstool cottages 
all whelmed in by the untimely twilight for as we drew into the inn yard a great white-top vehicle of some indistinguishable kind lumbered off in the opposite direction and i gave instant chase through the gloom and first cold drops of the imminent storm my lift luck which had deserted me all morning was it seemed to hold now until i was safe at the end of the day's ramble for it proved to be a brewer's covered dray and in it a drayman of the right kidney i was soon snugly tucked away under the waterproof tilt and the three smoking horses pounding along before me through the rain and darkness with the great hills looming up vast and shadowy on either side i had reached the black downs at last it seemed but was destined to see little or nothing of them in the pitch-dark night and the driving torrent what i could see however made me wish i had hastened my progress earlier in the day so that i might have passed them in the gold of the pleasant afternoon and when we began to go down on the other side these regrets still farther increased there must have been a view over half the county judging by the twinkling lights that studded the landscape far and near we seemed to be going down into an enormous gulf an immeasurable plain beginning almost under the horse's feet and stretching to the far horizon but i soon got over this disappointment it was the luck of the road and with that i had no business but to rest content the drayman proved a very different travelling companion from the young farmer he did most of the talking and when he was not talking he made the hills echo with snatches of song or burst into merry fits of whistling i found he wanted nothing better than that i should sit still and be entertained by him and this i did willingly enough at last he stopped short in the midst of his music to put me a question and where are ye going on to tonight it brought me out of my ruminations with a start now where was i going i asked myself for to say truth i had never once thought of this whole day through the question was disconcerting well i answered him hesitating what sort of place is is slumber well i happened luckily on the spur of the moment to remember the name from the map slumber well oh pretty like but awful dead quiet i tell ye there tis away down yonder where you see they little blink o lights i can put ye down just at the end of the lane to it half an hour later i was standing in the dark and wet under a melancholy little signpost by a side turning watching the lamp glow from the dray souse out dismally amongst the trees and wondering what kind of fortune awaited me whither i was bent the night was of a cimmerian blackness in the tree-tops the wind raved like a demented thing all around me as i felt my way along with my feet a thousand little rivulets splashed and gurgled in the deep of the woods but i was not long in striking slumber well the lane plunged down into what seemed interminable forest then brought up short on a spit of grassland which next morning i discovered to be the village green friendly lights beamed out at me from all sides and as i stopped outside one of the largest houses there sounded overhead a familiar creaking and groaning which i knew to be an ensign battling with the breeze that evening i spent by the tap-room fire in an old oak settle with the landlord's slippers on my feet the jovial white-haired landlord himself at my elbow the landlady in curl-papers and spectacles 
sewing by the light of a tallow candle hard by and a wonderful old man and his son to complete the company others dropped in from time to time and dropped out again but we five made up the enduring elements of the scene we took it in turn to keep the talk going and the process was surprisingly easy each in turn related some simple experience the simpler the better provided it was wrapped about with numberless little details and unimportant etc and spun out to its last reach the old ploughman was specially great at this gentle exercise and held our little circle spellbound for a whole ten minutes while for instance he related how he had succeeded in stopping a pig at decently long intervals throughout the evening the landlord and i replenished our glasses but neither the old man nor his son could be induced to take more than their one great two-handled mug of beer i pressed them several times but got always the same rejoinders from the old man a smiling steady refusal from the son no more than a gloomy reluctant shake of the head he was a heavy-jowled youth of about forty this son with an air of harbouring some deep grudge against the pot before him for whenever he drank it was always with a savage indignant stare over its brim never no more than the wan drop explained the old man finally and halbert here and never takes no more neither at which halbert with an angry snort drained the mug to its dregs and stalked to the door slamming it behind him as he went when he was gone the landlady nudged my arm now ask him again she whispered i renewed my protestations that another half pint could scarcely hurt him at the end of a long day's work the old man looked down into the empty mug then rose to his feet i had just a little matter as i must see to way home he said moving to the entry i won't be more than a minute folks do say explained the landlady when we were alone as he swore a vow to his wife on her deathbed never to drink more than one drop at a sittin so now he allers goes for a bit of a walk o twin drinks he'll hear it sure now when a comes back again and so he did my bed that night was a magnificent old four-poster with crimson rep hangings and a mahogany cupid on the headboard who aimed arrows at me all night through but i was in no hurry for sleep i sat a little by the open window it was still very dark but the rain had ceased the wind had blown itself out and a few stars were breaking through the dense storm-rack overhead as i looked out wondering at the quiet and peace of everything after the deluge uncertain footsteps sounded on the road beneath i could just make out the figure of a man he stopped right under my window and gave forth a rich unctuous chuckle there was no mistaking the voice it was halbert's he stood for a while with his legs very wide apart like a ship captain in a gale then slowly and deliberately sat down in the mire of the roadway the luxurious contented chuckle uprose once more through the quiet of the night and then this soliloquy i am drunk and i likes it whereupon he carefully got to his feet again and resumed his way End of chapter four